Katie got. Next question. Um, hey Dave, how are you? Thank you for keeping your channel going with Ask the Doc. Uh, the most valuable channel when it comes to testosterone and understanding the testosterone. You can call me Sam to make it easier if you need to mention my name. Okay, Sam. So I am 30, I'm 36 years old and I'm 5'7". Uh, um, I was overweight for a very long time. I started working out after my doctor told me I might get diabetic. Uh, the doctor put me on TRT. Uh, after a couple of blood work, however, I'm not sure if my doctor knows what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> Every time they do my blood work uh, is two days after my injection and my numbers are high. I know what you're going to say. <laughs> they tell me to get off the testosterone injection and wait four weeks and do a follow-up blood work. I'm kind of tired of that. I go through the roller coaster. I don't think that is productive at all. I wanted to know if you can ask doc, uh, the doc if these are alarming test results for my, uh, for my, from my doctor. Uh, no, for my doctor does not check my free test or estrogen level. I don't think they know exactly how TRT works. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't live on the West Coast. I am in Charlotte, North Carolina. I wish I was there um, to see a doc doctor. Uh, there were more doctors than Dr. Ran. I hope you can advise me and, and guide me to some uh, doctors down here who can help me better. My blood test, uh, my blood work is below, and the doctor said I am at risk of stroke due to high due to blood clot. So I'll let you read the text if you have to. Um, doc, uh, I'm subscribed to your channel. Hopefully you can ask this question uh, for Dr. He calls you Randall. I don't know. <laughs> I know. I, I want to know if I'm really at risk over here. Uh, do you there's know if there's any way for me to contact him directly? Uh, yes, there is actually. Uh, we always put the guys, uh, Dr. Rand's uh, email and all that stuff in the video you guys, but I'll, I'll let you take it from there. Doc. Okay. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not making excuses for the docs out there. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't mean that the way that sounds either. I, they don't need to have any explanation. You, you, there are no experts in this area. There's no, uh, I had this unfortunate discussion with a, an ENT doctor recently who was telling me I didn't know what I was doing because I didn't have a specialty in this area. And well, <laughs> arguably the specialty is endocrinology, right? Uh, some would argue, well, it's, yeah, but since it's down in the area of the genitals, it really un it falls under the category of urology. But this isn't taught in medical school, and certainly it's not taught to ENTs, <laughs> which made that argument ridiculous. It wasn't even an argument. I had to listen to be, you know, I was berated for a while. But anyway, um, we we don't learn this in medical school. I mean, we spend maybe 20 minutes on the sex hormones, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, DHA, and pregnenolone. And that's it, you know. Uh, so and again, I'm not making excuses, but first of all, you have to find a doctor that that is continuing to study after receiving the degree and licensure. And some doctors maybe don't want to, but you know, where I will get on docs is first of all, don't fake it. Second, I mean, this is clearly faking it because some of the things that if he's quoting the doctor correctly, the doctor's saying are just flat wrong. Uh, just say, hey, well, I don't do that, and you know, let's see if we can find you a different doctor who does specialize in this, and everybody will be happy, I would think. Um, I don't know why he was told he might be diabetic or heading toward being a diabetic. Uh, I don't see any blood sugars, a hemoglobin A1C, or any, you know, obviously I don't see any of the patients that we're talking about here, but um, yes, taking your blood work on day two after your injection, you're gonna find pretty much the highest levels you're gonna find all week. Now that does vary individually, but on average, it's two and a half days after your injection, you're gonna see the highest titer of testosterone. So the yes, yeah. you're gonna see the, the worst. Now, yeah. the problem with that is, who cares? Who cares what the peak is? As I said earlier, there's probably a half dozen, probably more by now studies. Uh, certainly, if you, know, if you go outside of the English language, I have to bet there are, that show that up to 600 milligrams of testosterone, cypionate, each week can actually be better for you. Now, I know it's not something that the AMA is going to sign off on anytime soon, and we just, we just don't do it, but um, it, it points to the fact that you don't have any risk if, for example, I call it, you know, if you're a cheap date and less goes farther with you because you don't metabolize the testosterone as quickly as some others do, the norm. Um, and I say that, you know, the 600 milligrams, they were making sure that the, the potential side effects were getting nipped, you know, that the estrogen was under control and you were watching for elevated hemoglobin hematocrit, which, yes, 
if you look at this gentleman's blood work, which I guess these aren't posted. So, okay, his red blood cell count was 5.5, and that's 10 to the sec. Well, everyone knows what uh, we're talking about, I, I would assume. If, if not, then just ignore this. You know, I won't read you everything, but RBC of 5.5, red blood cell count, hemoglobin 16.7 grams per deciliter, and hematocrit 51%. That's the most important thing listed here. And, and that's what you look to when you're thinking about clot because you're talking about blood viscosity in a very general sense you're thinking the more viscous the more chance of a clot I have plenty of athletes elite uh, athletes certainly but you know still plenty of very healthy people that have levels uh, this high of hemoglobin hematocrit hemoglobin is what carries oxygen uh, on a red blood cell and you want plenty of those around if you're an athlete and you want the oxygen ca uh, carrying capability around too uh, the problem is, uh, to use a decent analogy, I hope, uh, if you create more hemoglobin and therefore a bigger bed in your pickup truck, that's great, you can carry more, but if you create too many trucks, then you have a traffic jam, and what good does it do to be able to hold more in the pickup truck? You can't get it where you need to go anyway. So that can actually happen, symptomatically anyway. When I start to see these elevations, uh, the I start to see elevations in hemoglobin hematocrit. Okay, uh, but we're talking about I normally see symptoms when you start to get into the 18s. And I don't know if you read most texts it says that 18.5 hemoglobin is critical. Well, I have a patient that has polycythemia rubavera, and his hemoglobin, and typically I just focus on hemoglobin hematocrit is about three times hemoglobin. His hemoglobin is invariably 26. Now, do I? advocate running around with a hemoglobin of 26 absolutely not but he's never stroked once in his life and he doesn't take anything to prevent stroke either in other words he's not taking a blood thinner we call um, an anti-platelet uh, uh, drug or anything like that so um, I'm not saying bend the rules I'm just saying that I, I, I certainly don't think that I'm just trying to put it in perspective mm -hmm. here that this guy's blood work here is reflective of an, uh, a stroke risk at all I mean, let's just cut to the chase. Now, we all know that some doctors are maybe trying to find reasons to tell you to get off it because they yeah. don't feel comfortable with you on it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is also bad medicine. I mean, if you don't understand it, don't don't put it down. Just yeah. say, hey, I don't get it. I'm not going to treat you for this. Yeah. And send, send somewhere else. Uncomfortable, you know, yeah. we, we all get that. But yeah. um, what I would suggest is that I don't know if you're being forced into taking your, your labora uh, laboratory draw uh, two days afterwards or not, but... I like to check my patients on the day of the testosterone injection, but before you do your injection. So seven days after so your last. So the last, yeah. So I can see your trough. Last because yes. yeah. the lowest. For me, again, knowing that high is not the issue. I mean, I've said this before. The fluctuations, forget about numerically, but in effect on, on a male, the fluctuation you see is like putting a three-foot wave on a 20-foot wall of water. If I could give you daily injections and one day of the week I give you testosterone, the rest is just saline or some placebo, so you wouldn't know the difference. Most of the time, and I mean really most of the time, well, all the time if we've dosed you properly, whether it's at the peak or the trough, so all the time, if it's at the peak or the trough and we're keeping you therapeutic, dosed properly, you can't tell me where you are. In other words, most of my patients, like I said all, I say most, and I still, sus I'm you suspicious mean they of can't the feel it? They can't tell me, okay, well, I just peaked. You did it, uh, that, the real injection was two and a half days prior, and I'm peaking now. No. If I haven't dosed you properly, you're a fast metab metabolizer, and, and so, okay, we have to do it every six days to keep you at a tighter that makes sense, and more importantly, so your symptoms are gone, and you're feeling good, okay, your symptoms are low T. Uh, that's, that's different than... Um, I mean, because you, you should feel it. And, you know, some patients are very sensitive. They go, yeah. That having been said, again, to my point, I see patients come in with a level of 400 on day seven before the next injection. I say, well, how are you feeling? You feel good all week? Yeah, great. Okay, then if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? But we've known since roughly 19, somewhere in the 1950s that, and they used total testosterone back then, 800 nanograms per deciliter or less for the average individual. And, you know, that's not right here. It's here. Um... Anything below that is subtherapeutic. You don't get the relief of symptoms, right? So I like to see what it is on day seven because then 
if you are complaining, like, yeah, doc, I swear, by six or seven uh, days post-injection, every week it's kind of like, yeah, I'm kind of looking in. forward to my shot because I feel a different. Okay, if I see a level of, you know, 1,300 still, I'm less likely to think it's due to the testosterone, despite, you know, I, give, I grant you, that's probably what it is, but okay, it makes us wonder. But certainly if it's 400, I go, okay, gee, this is a no-brainer, right? Yeah. I mean, it gives us, obviously, fuel for making a change. Um, so let's see if you can get the, the lab draw on day seven. And yeah, you shouldn't be going on and off every four weeks. Four weeks, I mean, that's just ridiculous. Well, also, the half-life. Because it's too high. They're just like, oh, it's too high, so let's back it off. Well, four weeks. I'm assuming, unless this is testosterone undecanoe, which this doctor sounds like he wouldn't even know that that exists. And I'm, I'm making a joke. <laughs> I don't mean, I really don't mean to braid it. No, anyway, no. But, you know, at the same time, you got to be responsible for what you're, for the medicine you're practicing. But really, I, I probably it's probably depo, which is testosterone cypionate. Mm -hmm. It's an eight-day half-life. By the 10th day, more than likely, on average, this guy's going to have lower T than when he started, okay, because he suppressed it for a while. And then, you know, you're waiting four weeks before you get another shot. That's ridiculous. I like testosterone cypionate because of the half-life and with, the, you know, the dose. It makes it easy to, to have a once-a-week dose that fits into most people's yeah. feeling better. It's a nice way to design a protocol once a week, right? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's a problem. I understand being in uh, maybe a small town, well, Charlotte, smaller than LA certainly, or Houston, that maybe that's an issue, but if you could find another doctor that specializes in this, this would be a good idea. Um, you want to know if you know anybody. <laughs> I don't know anybody over there, unfortunately, but... Uh, but people can contact you here, or give them the website, Doc. The I website. mean, I, don't, I always put it on the thing. P P uh, it's PSRMED, which stands for Performance Sports and Rejuvenation Medicine. Yeah. But the phone number, it's easy to just call it. Yeah, yeah, 310 yeah. Happy to, you know, coach you as to how to approach a doctor, because I, I am one, and, you know, so, and by the way, I should be allowed to bag on my profession, but also boost it up where, where yeah. appropriate, you know, it is my profession. I don't mean to be, uh, you know, well, it's, it is kind of weird, this, because uh, another thing is, if, if you saw a high level, a doctor, of a thyroid, okay, let's say your T3 is, uh, you know, uh, 5.6, right? Well, you see a T3 at 5.6, um, yeah, which is way too high. The first thing a doctor should ask you if you're on replacement therapy that likely he's prescribed is, oh, well, gee, Dave, when was the last time you took your thyroid dose before the exam? Was it the night before? Or or, you know, it should be in the morning, right? Mm. Did you take your dose that morning? Yeah, Doc, I took it like I always do. Uh, it was about two hours before I took the, the, the lab draw. Oh, okay, well, that explains it. And he'll either probably tell you, should have told you, hey, don't take your thyroid the morning of the exam, please. Yeah. Uh, you know, the draw. So we can see. Uh, so we can see. Normally, we'll say, well, yeah. let's check you la next time. How you feeling? You know, everything fine? You're not having uh, anxiety? You know, go through the other ways to make sure that the clinical signs and symptoms to make sure you're okay and yeah. postpone it till the next time. With testosterone, for some reason, the bells ring. Defcon one, you know, it's 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 it's, it's this kind of thing. Yeah. Oh my God, it's way too high. Instead of asking, well, wait a minute, when was your last injection? Because the whole purpose of the esterification of the testosterone is to make it so it's more easily dosed. So you have to jab yourself with a needle every day. Right. Which goes off on another tangent of this whole thing about, you know, microdosing, it's kind of defeats the purpose in my mind, but right. maybe we'll find there's a purpose for it one of these days. But again, to stay on point here, you're gonna have a fluctuation, just like you have a daily fluctuation in your thyroid, and you, know, you have to take it every day. I, I'm sure if you were on thyroid medication, you'd love to be able to take it once a week if it had the same uh, Effect on yeah, yeah. efficacy as, as not, right? So this is just something that's part of the business right now of medicine and, and dealing with testosterone, which even though it's been around, discovered in 1935 and been used as, as to treat since the 1950s for sure, and arguably in the 40s when you know certain um, countries were using it in warfare even to keep the troops going, mm. uh, it, it, it somehow fell out of favor in the 70s. You know, we banned it in the Olympics in 76, and mm -hmm. you know it's only now coming back into use more and uh, again, not taught, and no excuses, but yeah, you're gonna run across this more often than not. Yeah. Change it a little bit, but yeah. All right, thanks, Doc.